Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ask Historian podcast. Today, as it is the 100th episode, and we are fast approaching 700,000 subscribers, we have decided to do something a little bit different. We have a panel of Ask Historians moderators to talk about Ask Historians under the hood. One is like to moderate and run the world's largest academic history forum. Ask Historians has grown a lot in its six, nearly seven years of existence, spawning several articles, helping several careers, several academic panels, which you can hear in earlier episodes, and this podcast. So if you have no interest in Ask Historians as a Reddit community, this podcast might be of less interest to you. But regardless, we have a great lineup today. The format today will be brief discussions of, of individual moderators about different aspects of Ask Historians, followed by a period of comment by the whole panel. Quick side note, because of time constraints, the book will be drawn on the next podcast. Please do support us on Patreon and elsewhere. Today, we are joined by user Bernadito, better known as Stefan, flared in Mata Gorilla and Counterinsurgency to talk about the development of the subreddit in his own development. You can also catch him on episodes 39 and 40, talking about Algeria and counterinsurgency. User number two is Kami Space Invader, also known as Joe, who's flared in Holocaust, Nazi Germany, and Wehrmacht war crimes to talk about Holocaust denialism, the academic theories underpinning academia and academic historians, and the emotional labor of working on a very difficult topic. You can also catch him on episode 91 and 57, talking about fascism and intentionalism and functionalism in the Holocaust. User number three is Snapshot52, known as Kyle, flared in Native American studies and colonialism to talk about theory and non-Western and subaltern points of view and the difficulties and pleasures of this. You can also catch him on episodes 75 and 80, talking about Indian policy and Indian sovereignty and cultural genocide against Native, against Native American Indians. User number four is Chocolate Pop, known to her friends and family as Cassie Prococo, flared in the history of Western fashion to discuss one of his like having interests that are contrarian to the Reddit hive mind and culture, and what it's like to bring women's history to life. Catch her on episode 45, talking about Regency era fashion. Use a number five, Hippocrates, known as Rule, flared in Greek warfare to talk about being an expert in a field. Academic view is diametrically opposed to the public one, and how ask historians the perfect opportunity to do something about it because the questions come from the public. Catch him also on episode 81, discussing Hippocrates and his reforms. Finally, we will have user Georgie K. Zukov, flared in post-Napoleonic warfare, small arms, and dueling to talk about numbers and statistics in the state of the subreddit as a whole. Without further ado, let's get to it. Welcome to the show, everybody. You guys Hello, everyone. Hi, <laughs> 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 everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. We're allowed to talk about it. <laughs> uh, for, first up, we will have Stefan talking about um, as historians and his own development. All right. Well, these are my personal memories of the early days of the subreddit. It's difficult to remember a time on Reddit before I ask historians. Yet six years ago, that's the situation I find myself in. Unlike today, where you can easily access subreddits dedicated to a variety of historical topics, most of them visual, there were no such availability in the dark ages of 2011. You either find yourself in a history-related thread on Ask Reddit, or you frequented r slash history. Even back then, you tried to avoid Ask Reddit, and you usually had little choice but to subscribe to r slash history. That's where my story began. At the time, and I'm sure, I'm sure it still is, it was a casual place to talk about history. Many future contributors to Ask Historians also had their start in that very subreddit and contributed with great posts, but it still felt too disorganized and the discussions were usually superficial. The time was ready for a new alternative. Unbeknownst to me, one such alternative was already in the making. On August 28, 2011, Ask Historians was born. I was casually browsing r slash history one day in the autumn of 2011 when a post advertising Ask Historians caught my eye. The post was made by uh, the founder of the subreddit. And it's worth to keep, it's important to keep that in mind for the later uh, developments of the subreddit. But before we, we get to that, I want you to take a step back and examine his Ask Historians in October of 2011. The differences between then and now are striking. It might pe appear ironic that Ask Historians was founded by a user who frowned upon strict moderation, 
But that was made very clear in those early days. There were no established rules or guidelines. The majority of the posts posted in the early days of the sub would have been removed immediately. That includes uh, the first post I ever made, which was a simple book recommendation on October 14, 2011. Today, we have strict rules against uncivil behavior. Back then, it would be nearly impossible for one rude user to get banned despite repeated offenses. It wasn't all that bad, though. Many of the most prolific users began posting during this time with answers that even today still hold up. The first panel of historians appeared in the early days of the subreddit, and the first flares were awarded. Although, I should point out, the quality of the answers required were far, far lower than today. I applied to be a flared user in that very first thread and got accepted. Had I sent in that application today with the same comments, I would have denied myself a flare. Soon enough, on April 7, 2012, Ask Historians finally received their first moderators. I think it's fair to say that we owe them a great deal. Eternal Carry, Agent DFC, and NMW were instrumental in writing the basic rules and enforcing the strict moderation, despite the protests from the founder of the sub. All three of them had direct experience of the early days of the subreddit, and although those early days were far from controlled or civil, they were certainly formative, and it was thanks to those lawless days that the strict rules of today came to, fr to fruition. I owe that first group of moderat moderators a special thanks for giving me a place in the history of the subreddit, because they selected me as part of the second batch of moderators on September 28, 2012. That's where my part of the story ends in the early days of Ask Historians. It's been more than six years by now, and it wouldn't have been possible without all of you, whether you're a moderator, a flared user, or simply someone who likes to read answers. Thank you for doing what you do and for being a part of Ask Historians. Uh, did anybody have any questions or any call-up comments did you want to add to on to that? Go ahead, Joe. So as someone who's basically seen the whole history of this whole forum, how would you describe the different phases? Were there different phases or did it just like when you say they wrote the rules, would you just say they, they basically laid out the whole code of conduct and then it was only refined? Or in your opinion, was there another like phase of development that went on to refine several of these rules? Uh, could you comment on that uh, just in general? Sure. Um... Yes, there were def there were different phases. I mean, when I when we talk about the first rules, we're we're only talking about a rule that, for example, demanded that you know, hey, sources, that's a good thing. That was usually the kind of uh, sort uh, kind of rules we're talking about in the beginning, and that developed. I mean, over the years, over the the batches of new moderators came new ideas and and uh, even stricter moderation and. And uh, so I would definitely say that it's been a continuous development that I have seen and that has only made the sub subreddit so much better, in my opinion. I would just say, from my perspective, I was one of the earliest flared members, I believe, in panel three or panel four. So I, but I didn't become a moderator until much, much further along. So it was interesting seeing, I think some of the crucial moments were at the very beginning where we had other subreddits trolling us, pretending to be a famous historian, and the moderators really came down and cracked down, and realized that we needed to have a con controlled atmosphere and controlled set of rules. And it was just like seeing that develop slowly and very, very painfully in some cases to be like, no, this person may contribute, but their history is substandard, or they don't understand sources, or they're just rephrasing Wikipedia, to realize that and to come to be much more of an academic subreddit and to realize that sourcing and historiography and the method is very important. It's just a very important development. Yes, absolutely. I think that April, April 7, 2012, when we got our first moderators, was a turning point. Immediately, if we look in our own private Ask Historians Mod subreddit, we can actually start seeing the first drafts for new rules, for, for upholding a certain quality, and so on. And of course, 
the infamous uh, Game of Trolls incident did change a lot of things. It did, uh, you know, made things stricter for the better, in my opinion. But also other rules, which uh, today are quite obvious, but back in the day weren't like that, um, that we had strict rules against. Today we have strict rules against unstable behavior, but that wasn't the case in the early days of the sub. And there was one particular user who I will not name by name, but anyone who knows the early days knows this this user who was in a was very very adamant in World War II Soviet uh, Union history. Not not you, Hunter, but another another guy. He'd uh, he'd essentially he was the most stubborn uh, man you'd ever meet, and one of the most rudest as well. And it took quite some time before uh, he was kicked out. Today he'd get kicked out after two warnings, and uh, but uh, he stuck around for a few years. Does anybody else have anything they want to add on to that? Or... Uh, actually, yeah, I had uh, a question that I wanted to uh, bring out. It's mentioned about how in the early days that the subreddit was fairly laxed and that uh, it progressed to where it is now. Did you envision at any point that Ask Historians would become something at this point, whether with regards to the strict rules or maybe the, the culture that's been developed in particular? I can't on I in those early days, I was just happy to find a place. It, to, to me, it was more of finding a, a community that catered to those needs and, and desires that, that, that I wanted, that I was looking for in a subreddit. But as time went on, I began to see a potential for, for something that was much greater than just some really knowledgeable people answering questions. It became, but that, I think, didn't come around until the first moderators got involved. Those three individuals were, in my opinion, incredibly important in, in shaping the future of the subreddit and just giving it a more professional and, and more, uh, more civil character to the sub. And that's when I was really taken back and be like, okay, this can actually be something. And I had seen their uh, participation before and I had admi I admi I admired them then. I admire them tremendously now. And it was something that came so natural from, from these people's participation. And they laid m much of the groundwork. And I think, like I said, thanks to them, we have the subreddit we have today. I have uh, one last question, which is something we, I think, actually tried to figure out, figure out a while ago. One of the best rules we have, in my opinion, is the 20-year rule, because it prevents from subjects we don't want to talk about <laughs> becoming questions in the sub, <laughs> namely those subjects that deal with 9-11. Um, uh, but um, we've tried to figure out a while ago um, how did that come about? Like, nobody seems to really remember who came up with that rule and who had the original idea and what the original reasoning was behind that was, was behind it. So do you remember what, what it was? Well, well, I would have been around for that. Uh, do I remember? No, I don't remember. <laughs> but, but I must say that, once more, uh, before all of these rules, which are so obvious to, to us today, before they existed, we were swamped with these kind of questions. And I'm not just talking about 20 year, I mean, I mean, questions about post, uh, what would it be, 1991 at the time or 1992, but questions on um, alternative history. That was really popular. Alternative history questions just dominated. Uh, another one would have been uh, questions with a very, very clear political thought behind. So soapboxing questions. Those three uh, type of questions, modern day questions, soapboxing questions, and alternative history questions, they took a while before they were being removed. They, they, that was one of those uh, things that are obvious to us today, but weren't back in the day. And that, I don't remember when exactly it was, but it was a process. And I guess, to be honest, in the end, we moderated, just, just grew tired of those kind of questions and were like, Please just just spare us. Show us some mercy. Okay, thank you very much. Up next, we have uh, Gerald giving us a little talk. Uh, yes, thank you. And I'm going to start with the concept of of emotional labor. It's a concept from from sociology, and it generally means the idea that uh, managing one's emotion is pretty hard work. 
This is often applied to, especially in like a work environment. And this is often applied to, for example, uh, service job workers where remaining friendly, regardless uh, how they feel themselves in that particular moment, is an actual requirement that is essential to their job. Now, this does not necessarily apply to us one-on-one -on -one because obviously, like firstly, we don't get paid for what we do here. But both responding to questions as well as moderating the sub under the standards we have set for ourselves can get emotionally burdensome at time regarding both the form of the questions we get as well as how we are responded to by users. Both of these things can get on an emotional level exhausting to a point where some of us even have taken breaks on occasion after say a particularly difficult threat or a particularly exhausting week. So we get a variety, a wide, wide variety of subjects um, that are asked about. The, and these range from rape to torture to genocide to violence and so on and so forth. And while subjects such as these can be emotionally exhausting in themselves, even for those of us where they are part of one's day job, like in my case, there often is another phenomenon involved, and I'd like to call this phenomenon that we as moderators have observed over the years, both in questions and how people respond to us, I'd like to call it as a sort of empathy gap to explain whether professionally or self-taught, trained or self-taught, people who deal extensively with history are usually very aware that what we talk about involves actual human beings. These might be long dead human beings, but they're still actual people nonetheless. And to be aware of this fact is not necessarily something that comes naturally to people when dealing with history. School education, popular media, other forms of entertainment often train us to regard history as a sort of subsequent processes where things just happen one after the other while not necessarily highlighting that it involves actual people in these processes. It's, it's usually like years of rule, battles that occurred, buildings finished, and territory taken over. That's why the further removed we are from the past, the more it can seem like fiction to us in the popular consciousness. And as historians, we find ourselves in a situation where we are trained to counter this phenomenon. We are taught not just to see a pair of Roman aqueducts, we are taught to think about the people who built these aqueducts and under what conditions they did so. This line of thinking can reveal historically relevant information that can deepen our understanding of the past. Just to use as a quick example, there is a World War II historian named Lizzie Collingham, and she wrote a book about food in World War II. The main point of, of her book basically is that food policy by the major countries involved was not just driven by delivering as many calories as possible to their civilians and soldiers, but was also driven by a concern for variety in diet simply because you can't win a war when you just feed your people potato. People want to have a, a varied diet, and that was the driving concern. And you only discover this concern and make this historical point when you actually take into account that we're talking about actual people here, people who will not eat potatoes for four years. But coming to what this has to do with our sub, on this level of, let's call it, historical empathy, there can be a gap between what people who ask questions understand the subject to be and what we understand the subject as. From this, and especially when these expectations clash, exhausting emotional labor can arise. Let me give an example. A couple of months ago, we had this really highly upvoted thread about a couple of not safe for work pictures that depicted a couple of women performing a sex show for American soldiers. The question basically was, what do these photos show and how common was that? Uh, scores and scores of comments obsessed over the time frame and the location of these photos. What so many people saw in these pictures 
was a historical mystery to solve that concerned dates and times and probably units involved. When I, what I saw in these photos and what eventually made it in my answer was a social dynamic underlying what was depicted. What they essentially showed was a highly charged situation, a situation where women sexually entertained men in a historical context of an extreme power imbalance. When we placed these photos during World War II, and this was most likely when they were taken, we are talking about a situation where there is a complete breakdown of public law and order that is replaced by armed men with the literal power over life and death. It's a situation in which the issue of consent, the idea that two adults in relatively equal situations concerning, uh, in relatively equal situations concerning their power in, within the relationship can consent freely to sexual acts. This issue of consent becomes extremely muddled at best, if not impossible at worst in the context, in this historical context. Seeing this and then writing about it in a way that explains these issues to an audience where <clears throat> we have to assume that there is little prior knowledge is an extremely difficult process. It requires walking a fine line of empathizing and being aware that these are real people, while at the same time writing with a professional manner and tone. This can be, on an emotional level, a rather exhausting process. Um, and the same holds true for responses on difficult topics that we regularly get and that I and others have written extensively about. But the reason I chose this example is because it didn't end there. After I had finished, there were still scores of questions if one couldn't figure out where exactly these photos were taken. And when I stated that my desire to investigate further was rather limited because the underlying dynamic that I was talking about was, in my opinion, historically more interesting and important, and that finding out where they were taking is virtually impossible, the responses I got were not great. Somebody literally replied to me to get my feelings out of history, and instead that I should do what I'm here for. Answer the question as desired by them. And this is the second part of the before mentioned gap. Sometimes we as respondents are not regarded as people who might on occasion have a hard time with answering questions like how were people killed exactly during the Holocaust or something similar. Rather, there seems to be this notion that we are a sort of automaton here to perform the exact service somebody wants and best quick and fast. An empathy gap that extends to not just the people in history, but also the people who write about them like us. However, while the latter thankfully doesn't manifest that often, the former is an actual phenomenon that can be empirically observed. Rule once had to explain to someone why the sack of Carthage wasn't cool. One of the most asked questions on the sub is about the PTSD of ancient soldiers with literally no question ever, like none, none. Dealing with the PTSD of a uh, civilian population after the sack of a city. We have scores and scores of questions that treat the Holocaust as a process rather than something that, that happened to actual people. So, and for us, those who are trained to see the people behind the history, those who are trained to make the subaltern speak, so to say, this is a frequent topic of discussion among us because it is challenging to see all these things but have them so frequently ignored. It is emotional labor to, re to remain professional and matter-of-factly and write something engaging that highlights these aspects in the face of so little consideration for them by our audience. Now, of course, expanding upon historical empathy and spreading awareness of it fits right with the purpose of our whole undertaking, to teach people about history. And I think, I hope, we are doing a good job about it. But it's also important to highlight this topic when talking about our own work as we do in this framework right now. Because we do frequently discuss it and it does affect us when moderating or responding. Thank you, Joe. I think that that's just a really, really valid point. It's, it's so easy to get swept up in like, oh, well, let's just think of these people as characters in a fictional novel. Let's think of these people as getting lost in the story of history in a sense but not thinking of like these are real people who ate and slept and died and not and suffered anybody else have any follow-up i think kyle had something 
Yeah. Um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, Joe, this is something that we've all um, really talked about before at some point. But it, I think it's also important for us to maybe discuss uh, to a degree how we deal with it, like what are our personal ways of doing so. I mean, you mentioned that we sometimes we take breaks from moderating, and I think everybody at some point has has uh, done that. But what are some ways that you think are the best way to handle the emotional labor, at least for yourself? Well, I mean, I do deal on a day to day basis with a pretty with a pretty like crude or a pretty pretty horrific subject, which is as you know the Holocaust and where my war crimes and I, I find that what helps me is well, first of all, sometimes to really take a step back and and focus on something else like I do a variety of historic reading that is not related to the Holocaust or other reading that, that I enjoy in, in order to just clear my mind of things. Like I, I have long held this idea that if I ever get a, fed up with the Holocaust, I'm just going to write like the cultural history of the potato or something in that, in that vein, like something that is, that is a more, let's call it fun theme or at least something that is not related to, or at least only more tangentially related to cruel things. And I think the other thing is, it sometimes really is helpful to indeed take a step back and do something else entirely. I bake when I don't want anymore to read about my subject. So I think this, these are useful strategies, at least they are, they are for me. Next, we have Kyle um, going to talk to us about dealing with academic theory and looking at things in a non-Eurocentric Western point of view in the subaltern. Uh, I just want to start off by thanking everybody um, who has uh, said their part so far and those who are here uh, for participating and that uh, I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to meet with y'all and speak on this episode. Uh, about my perspective with regards to uh, the theory of how we operate on Ask Historians. As an indigenous person, moderating Ask Historians has been quite the interesting activity. Doing so has really highlighted the various layers that exist when trying to integrate what I know and how I do things with how the culture of both the subreddit and those who visit the subreddit operate. For example, I believe that all of our experiences, our memories, our values, beliefs, ethics, the people around us, the environments that we're in, uh, our cultures, our nationalities, the things that form our identity, everything, all of that informs the approaches that we as people take with regards to any given subject or matter. What I'm saying by all of this is that my viewpoints, just like any other given person on our subreddit, whether a subscriber or a moderator, has many influences in their life, and this creates multiple layers to how things are interpreted. This, in turn, governs how I, as well as the other moderators, help to regulate Ask Historians, and also how I interact with those who visit the subreddit. Uh, as noted in various places throughout the sub, such as in our rules, the purpose of Ask Historians is to, pro to provide an educational resource for people of the general public to learn about history and the past in an easily approachable manner. We as the moderators facilitate this learning process by providing a framework of rules for the information that is provided by both flared and non-flared users that conforms to, an academic standard of his uh, to the academic standards of history as a discipline. However, this isn't always an easy task. From my stance, I also want to contribute the marginalized voices of indigenous peoples to this purpose. So the question is, how can this be done? After all, people in general, including our users, cannot ask about things that they do not know about. And if they can't do this, then we cannot facilitate the learning of history, particularly where it would prove valuable. Let's take, uh, for example, a feature thread of ours, the Monday Methods thread. It's a bi-weekly feature that we have on Ask Historians that is aimed at introducing theoretical and methodological concepts that are used in the respective fields of the flared contributors. Since I've started contributing, I've had the opportunity to meet the goal of Ask Historians by providing different perspectives to the topics we've discussed on Monday Methods an indigenous perspective. One of the more salient differences that I see in how we are creating this educational space for learning is that while we do this in an effective manner, 
it often comes from a Western-oriented worldview. And that is no fault to those who are aware of the benefits of diversity and encourage collaborative work, but this effect is reflective of the degree of diversification that exists in academia and how it is being transferred even to our online community, one that tries to bridge the gap between academics and the public. With regards to American Indians, it's usually lacking. This means that while many of our Monday Methods posts are great, insightful, and extremely useful, they don't always leave room for what is commonly made out to be the other. And this is where I've come to find my role within our community. My first Monday Methods post was entitled An Indigenous Approach to History. In it, I described what I refer to as an indigenous research paradigm and gave a basic overview of the values many indigenous cultures utilize in a theoretical framework and how these are applied to history as a discipline. From there, I've submitted several other posts for this feature that continue to develop what an indigenous perspective on things common in the Western tradition of history, such things as literature reviews, uh, ethical guidelines, and research methods. However, just as I stated earlier, all of our worldviews are influenced by our experiences, by our cultures, by the people around us, and so on. Uh, let's take for another example the demographic of our subreddit. The demographic is largely young American males, and this means that the backgrounds that these people have in this demographic are encountered by us, the moderators, on the subreddit. And truth be told, they often come into conflict with, personally speaking, my approach to history. Many American Indians, whether raised in an urban setting or on the res, often have to learn to walk in both worlds, so to speak. So while I was raised in my culture, there are various factors uh, throughout my life that have impacted the degree to which I was exposed to the values of indigenous uh, values of indigenous or Western origin. I have experienced and even supported many Western-centric things, but have come to learn that there are different ways of doing things. Yet, I find that I am able to understand where many people who like to challenge my current position are coming from. Some of the problems that arise, uh, they often stem from the lack, uh, the lacking public education system in the United States, in where many people grow up receiving false information about indigenous peoples, or perhaps reach problematic conclusions. These are often manifested in the questions we get on Ask Historians and the responses to my contributions. Thankfully, many of the experts on Ask Historians are able to bring to the table one of the key advantages that many of the general public don't always have access to in order to relay information. That is, access to the information to begin with, and the tools to disseminate it. In theory, this is a major way we accomplish the mission of our subreddit. So to me, that is the challenge. How do I, as a moderator and contributor to this form, and also an indigenous person, carry out the goal of the subreddit in a way that accommodates my understanding of the world? And while this might not be an active question that is consciously thought, I believe this inquiry is a cornerstone of thought for all the moderators and flared users on some kind of level. That is, how do we facilitate the learning of history to the best of our ability? Thus, this is partially what guides my conduct on the subreddit. Part of what I consider an indigenous, pro an indigenous approach is that my people, such as my tribe, the Nespers, have our own history and our own ways of validating what is true. American Indians as a racial group with respect to their own tribes have their own way of seeing history and their own methods of research and study. These other ways of doing things are just as valid as the commonly accepted Western ways of doing things, though that point is not always acquiesced by those who visit the sub. I'm not afraid to point out things that I believe to be true. You can see my posts on American Indian genocide denialism, posts that were met with a little bit of controversy. Still, my view is that the introduction of what might seem like contradictory information is that it all comes down to dialectics, discussing the truth that can exist within what boils down to our opinions. But I also realize that Western institutions are the dominant forces, at least in the area that I reside. That means that there is room for compromise, and I do so where I find ethically possible. Conforming to the historical method, providing credible sources, conducting research with veracity, these are all important values of mine, of indigenous peoples, and of the Western world, even the rest of the world, I believe. The idea is to realize, though, that there are multiple ways of doing this. Pushing this point is both a pleasure and a difficulty of mine as a moderator and contributor to Ask Historians. But bringing this back to the purpose of Ask Historians, 
I believe I have achieved what I hoped for, and this was accomplished because the community has stuck to its mission. My posts were welcomed by the mod team and even supported, though they might have contradicted what is accepted as the standard in Western academia at times. But by doing this, we are not only providing a resource for people to learn about history in an easily approachable manner, but we are providing a resource for people of the public to learn about different histories and from different perspectives with different tools. Um, I really enjoyed that. Does anybody else have any follow-up questions to that? Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, I, I run the Monday Methods with Kyle, and I have to say that your contributions, it's not just like the general community at large, but I also have learned really a lot from them. I am obviously not, not American. I don't know, and I still don't know if, if it would be different if I were American, but anyways, I'm, I'm part, certainly part of like Western learning institutions and this whole paradigm. And so I, I have to say like this, this, this whole experience of what our sub is really for, which means like expanding the horizon and learning about. I really did that through your through your contributions, like especially the ones about non uh, Western research paradigms and how to like the, the the ethically engagement with tribes. So thank you from from me as the other person who runs this feature and regularly features western stuff because it's what i'm you know what i'm socialized in well i appreciate the ability to share this with people and i appreciate even more when they you know they see the value in it to me it's, it's not about getting people to accept these new ways of introducing it but it's just treating them with equality and equity and realizing that you know there are different tools for every situation and that this is just another way of looking at things and that people don't have to accept it. But as you know, it was mentioned earlier and uh, you know, Joe, you're the one who, who brought this up to me that people can't ask about the things they don't know. It's very true. And so even if they don't accept it, the point is to at least make them aware of it. I see it. Hi. Um, what do you think we can do about people who resist wanting to include the other or any, anything that's non-Western. Because I, now I'm a, I'm usually more into military history topics, something that is very popular on the sub. And one of my prime interests is that of minorities in warfare and conflict. Now, I thought about something you said, which is very true, uh, first in regards to questions, because when people, for example, let's say they ask a question about the Second World War, one of the most popular topics we have, and they ask, how was life uh, in the Pacific theater of, of warfare in, 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 in the East? Uh, now, obviously, they would want an answer based on uh, either uh, an American experience or maybe if they're inclined to something more obscure, even a British experience. But they would not at all expect or even might welcome a perspective out of a uh, African or of a Nigerian or of a Kenyan perspective who fought in, in Burma or, or even an Indian perspective who, where they played a, a major role. What are your thoughts about this uh, kind of resistance? Well, yeah, it, it certainly um, is prevalent at certain points, this resistance to, uh, you know, what a lot of times people don't consider uh, the right way of doing things or the right kind of experience. And it, it's interesting. I had an instructor one time relate to me. Um, about philosophy departments in the United States that, you know, you go to a lot of institutions and you don't see them entitled the Western philosophy departments of the school. They're just entitled philosophy. And so I think part of the challenge is trying to get the, trying to get the people who are resistant to that to realize that the approaches that they are taking, that they understand, those themselves are not the default, that they're not the norm, that they are their own way of viewing things. They have their own lens applied to it. And I think in our setting, um, you know, where we're trying to bring these academics to the public, it helps to facilitate that because they're getting a much more direct experience rather than, ha than reading something scholarly on their own and then trying to draw their own conclusions um, without the experience or the tools. Um, but in general, you know, it's 
that, that really is the challenge, and I, I don't have an exact answer for it. The key to it, in my opinion, really is patience, because I've, I've dealt with those people both online and in real life, the people who, who didn't think American Indians even existed, and then you have to sit there for five minutes to convince them that, yes, I, we're still around. Um, so a lot of it is patience, and a lot of it is being able to understand where they're coming from as well. All right, um, so next up we have Cassidy Flaird in the History of Western Fashions. Thanks for having me on the 100th episode, Brian, and thanks everybody else for being here too. My name is Cassidy Prococo, and I study the history of fashion, uh, both academically and practically, by which I mean that I read exciting books like Dress Casual, How College Students Redefined American Style, and Fabricating Women, Seamstresses of Old Regime France, which deal with broad concepts uh, and heavier research into primary textual sources. And I also examine and sometimes reproduce antique clothing from the 18th through 20th centuries. And on an everyday basis, I actually wear mostly homemade clothing in 1950s styles. I love answering questions on Ask Historians, and I actually do a lot more of it as a moderator than I ever did as a flair, which I think makes me a bit of an anomaly, um, because it gives me an opportunity to do research that turns out to be really interesting, but which I might not necessarily have had a need to do. My day job is museum curator slash collections manager slash visitor services slash administrative assistant and everything else. So my research is usually done for the purposes of dating an item that has been donated to the museum or that I've found in an inventory or for finding out about aspects of local history for exhibitions, for research questions and so on. So my, one, of, one of my best answers is actually on the practice of veiling in ancient Greece, something that I had looked a little bit at in college when I wrote a paper on present day Muslim veiling, but I'd never really gone deep into the history of it. And you know, in everyday life, I wouldn't have a reason to, but because somebody asked on Ask Historians, I got to find out all about it. However, while I love doing this research, I don't really get many questions to answer. As has been said, my flair area is not that interesting to our user base, which is primarily made up of young men into military and political history. Because of that, I tend to get a lot of questions that are problematic in three distinct ways. The first category is questions that the asker doesn't actually seem to care very much about. Sometimes these might be like a shower thought, something kind of random, and I don't always tend to, priority it, to prioritize these as much if there's something else that I need to be doing, because I'm really here to help people who want to learn. And at other times, if it's something I haven't thought much about myself and I don't have a lot going on, I'll dig into them, and sometimes those turn out to be quite interesting. Second category is questions that assume a masculine default when they're asking theoretically about people or about clothing in general. For instance, why are most formal clothes black and white? This is obviously coming from somebody who thinks of formal clothes as tuxedos or business suits rather than, you know, evening gowns and cocktail dresses, which come in many, many colors. These I do like to answer because I get to point out that they're only thinking about half the population uh, while thinking that they're thinking about everyone. And sometimes they also can take you to an interesting place. The third category is a bit icky because these are questions where the asker and sometimes the people upvoting it, because this category often gets highly upvoted, have a kind of prurient interest or just interest in something gross. And um, like, how acceptable was it for a young woman to be topless in Anglo-Saxon England? How did Victorian women go to the bathroom in all that clothing? Did women get really sweaty dancing at balls in the 19th century? In one case, I actually got into a little bit of a fight with the poster. I don't know if you guys remember this, because I mentioned as part of my comprehensive answer that their question made me a little uncomfortable, and they were highly offended, probably more offended than I was. It's, uh, it's not my flair area, but I also answer a decent number of questions about women's history in general, particularly about the 18th through mid-20th centuries, the same period of time that I focus on. Uh, as far as clothing goes. Because as with the fashion questions, these would simply go unanswered if I didn't take them on. 
And this way, at least a few people can see that questions about women and about clothing are likely to get answered, and they might be encouraged to ask more questions on those subjects later. In the end, it's nearly always rewarding, um, no matter how gross the question. <laughs> I'm still getting information out there. I'm learning something myself a lot of the time, or else I'm finding out that something I thought I knew about had more nuances and subtleties, uh, something where there is a standard narrative in fashion history, and I find out that it's more complicated than we thought, and I end up refining my understanding. Sometimes this means that I'll answer essentially the same question three times as my knowledge progresses on the subject, which is always interesting. And I'm giving an answer to somebody who might otherwise never find out more about this topic. Even if I lose out on the acclaim of answering really popular questions most of the time. Most of the time, I do occasionally have one that hits it big, but not for the most part. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any follow-up questions for that one? Yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm, a lot of what you described, for me at least, or in my perception, would fall under this, this sort of empathy gap I talked about because, like, it, it goes a lot into this direction, like we talked about this in, in our group a couple of days ago, where I think Sun mentioned that somebody had asked a question on the sub, like, before the advent of modern medicine, how did women know they were pregnant? <laughs> yes, that one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it seems to me like when you're, when you're mentioning that there are these people that ask about basically what's like only half the population, that goes into a similar direction than, than this empathy gap. Like, is this, is this something that you would generally confirm within your observation, or would you say that there is more involved in that? Uh, no, I think it's pretty similar. There's definitely a lot of these questions, particularly ones that have to do with pregnancy, menstruation. I've had a few of those where it's just like something that this, the asker had never really thought about before, and suddenly, it's it's like in front of them and you can just tell that they have completely no idea where this is coming from and they have no idea what the answer could be and um, they're just not used to thinking about women as people who have to deal with these things uh, does anybody else have anything they want to say go ahead kyle so uh similar to how i have a position as an indigenous person both on the mod team and on the sub of course i would imagine that <clears throat> your perspective that you have um, as being a woman and being an academic who provides this information to everybody influences not only how you do things but also how you're perceived do you feel like since your time on the subreddit perhaps with regards to those who are aware um, of your gender you know do, do they let that has that been a barrier for you when either providing information or discussing something uh, of an area of expertise for you? It's actually kind of interesting because unlike a lot of women on Reddit, I don't seem to have, it doesn't seem to be too much of a problem for me when people realize that I'm a woman. Maybe it's because my area of, of expertise is like the most stereotypically feminine thing that you can have expertise in fashion. I, I actually occasionally get assumed to be a man. Even when I'm answering a question about women's clothing, I'll still have somebody say like, wow, that guy, he knows so much about dresses. It's definitely, there have, there have been occasions, I think, where somebody is responding to my moderation maybe a little bit more huffily because the girl with the fashion history flair has just told them their answer is not you know, sufficient. But it's definitely not as bad as I suspect it is for our moderator, Sun Against Gold, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, in part just because my, my threads don't tend to get as much attention. And so there's just not that, that density of Reddit users. Well, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, because, I mean, related to what Kyle is saying about how your topic is in, in many ways, you know, um, or your, your gender and your identity obviously affects the way that you're regarded on the internet, but also the topic that you study, because, I mean, it's well known that most of the questions we get, as Joe was saying, are going to be about World War II, about the Roman Empire, these kind of things. Do you ever get a sense that people think that fashion history perhaps it isn't like proper history, that this expertise is just not something that it's worth being good at or worth being interested in, and that you don't really have much to add to this debate? Do you get a lot of hostility? I guess, 
because of the specific thing that you do? And if so, like, how do you try to react to that? How do you, how do you, I feel like I actually get a little bit more of that off Reddit when it's in the, um, like the reenactment community. People sometimes feel like this is a setting. It's, it's sort of like a fictional setting where that people inhabit and therefore it's not that big of a deal to understand exactly how it works on Reddit. Usually when somebody asks a question in my field, they're just like, this is great. You've answered the question that I had. You know, that's all we needed. What I do get, and I think it's positive, at least feels positive to me, is people going, wow, I never had any idea that this could be so interesting, that fashion history could be something that I could be interested in, even though I'm a, you know, 23-year-old guy who is primarily interested in World War II, <laughs> and, and they like it, and, you know, they listen to my podcast, or they read one of my big answers. So that always feels pretty good, actually. So up next, we have uh, Ipocrates, known as Raul, and he's going to talk to us about what it's like being an expert in the field where the academic view is very different from the popular view of his field. Hi, right, thanks very much for having me. It's, um, it's been a great experience so far being both a player and a moderator on Ask Historians, and I guess what I'm about to do is a bit of sort of a love letter to the sub. Um, in many ways, I have this sort of luxury position of being simultaneously an academic who works on uh, on a particular field. I mean, I, I study Greek warfare, and when I first joined Ask Historians, I had literally just finished my PhD. But working in a field that has a sort of consistent popular interest, people want to know about Greek warfare. People have seen things in like, movies or read it in books. They've played video games that are about this, and they have questions about it. And this is something that really sort of drew me into Ask Historians and, and maybe stay there, is that there is a constant flow of questions about sort of aspects of what I do. And there wasn't at the time another expert who was really sort of covering this. Um, but in particular, because my field is recently, sort of in the last few decades, gone through a massive paradigm shift in the way that we look at this topic, the way that we look at Greek warfare, and the way that we look at things like ancient Sparta, has completely changed. Obviously, it takes a long time for these kind of academic insights to make it into public discourse, to make it into pop culture, and to become part of the public consciousness. Instead, what we get, you know, 10 years ago, uh, 300 came out, and this completely redefined and solidified how people look at Sparta in sort of the most old fashioned and outdated, and by now in academic terms, completely obsolete way. And so there is still a lot of work to be done there. And one of the fantastic things about Ask Historians is that you get a direct connection between people who have no academic background, who just sort of read, you know, read popular history, they read books, they learn about stuff in school, they see things in movies. They come to us with questions that are just based on what they pick up in life, you know, what they pick up around them. And then I can just talk to them directly, say, look, I know a guy who studies this. I've done this myself. I've read these sources. And I can go and, and, and tell them, how we look at that stuff now, how that's been reinterpreted in recent times. And it's really that direct connection that makes it incredibly worthwhile for me to be on Ask Historians and for somebody who works on something on a field that's really changing right now to be on Ask Historians because specifically you get to tell people, look, that's not how we look at this anymore. You get to be the conduit through which that change happens, through which that modern updated academic view gets communicated to the general audience to, to, you know, people who are interested in it. And they are interested. They love it. They want to know. I very rarely, and this really has struck me, and I'm really so, so happy about it, I rarely get pushback. I rarely get people and ask historians telling me, no, I just don't believe you. I just don't think that you're right with this revisionist bullshit. Like, people will say, oh, actually, that's really interesting. I hadn't realized that. People will say, oh, if that's how we look at it, like, what kind of material is there? Where, where can I read more about this? Like, they really want to have that cutting edge. They really are interested in that. And, you know, that makes it an incredibly rewarding experience. And this is why, you know, for me, it's been so for several years, it's been a continuous affirmation that what I do matters to people. They want to know about it. And that's good. Does anybody have any follow-up questions they want to add on to that? Go ahead, Joe. I have to say, I think it's absolutely great that you really experience what I think is, is one of the best aspects of our whole endeavor in that, you know, you have the feeling I can really go out and present, you know, what is new and what is exciting about all of this to an audience that really cares and will take that in and will appreciate that. Because I also deal with a fairly popular 
topic on the sub, which is the Holocaust and World War II, and what Hitler thought about a wide, wide variety of things. And frankly, I, on the other hand, have to have experienced pushback, which is like people hated my post about Ramo. And then we also fairly frequently get all these Holocaust deniers, which is really something that is still strange to me coming from a culture in the country where, you know, that shit is outlawed and, and will get you in jail eventually. So I'm really, really happy. It's more of a comment, but I'm really, really happy that, that I, this is maybe confined to some very specific topics that people feel very <clears throat> strongly about and is not an experience that, you know, our resident Spartan and Greek warfare expert and hopefully many others do not have. So I think that's more <laughs> my comment on this whole matter. Yeah, that's a fair point. I realize I'm in a bit of a privileged position where my field, I mean, there are a few people who are sort of really invested in having a particular view on this. Although when I did the same thing um, for a YouTube channel, we did get a lot of pushback from uh, YouTube commenters. So I do feel that it is to some extent to do with the fact that people who come to ask historians, they really do want to know um, and they want to get the cutting edge. They don't just want to sort of have their beliefs, their existing beliefs reconfirmed. So to some extent, of course, you will get, you know, and especially in, in other fields, they won't dare to comment on the experience of others. Um, you will get more of a sense of like what you're saying is not what I want to hear. Uh, it is something that I think sort of sets us historians apart specifically because it is, it develops this reputation of being the place where you go to get more depth, where you go to get the actual cutting edge, where you go to get the scholarly perspective rather than just to hear about something, you know, that you're happy to be very vaguely curious about. And in that sense, I think, you know, it does sort of pre-select a little bit towards people who may well be interested in hearing, uh, you know, the, the cutting edge. And to some extent, you know, we always have to be aware that there's this Reddit culture of wanting to be smug about having the latest point of view and, and you know, wanting to have the sort of the, the edge when you're having a conversation with a friend or something like that. Um, but generally speaking, I think it's good natured. I think it's genuinely just because people want to, they come to ask for because they want to know, that, they want to know the sort of the most in-depth uh, most up-to-date analysis. So finally, to kind of draw us towards a sort of conclusion, and I suppose one of the critiques of humanities in general is that there's not enough hard numbers, we have Georgie K. Zukov here to give us the hard numbers of the subreddit to show how the work we're doing is improving and how the subreddit is developing as a whole. Okay, hello everybody. I am Georgie Zukov, and I am here to talk about the work that we do kind of behind the scenes to maintain how the community is functioning and to monitor the health of the community. With Ask Historians, we like to consider ourselves something of a unique community in the Reddit world. And one of this, a uh, part of this is that we look to our community to be different. People have already talked about the rules regarding civility and how that came about to try and set us apart. And one of the, and in looking at ourselves as a unique community, we try to watch the health of the subreddit and ensure that we are not letting it down on our end. A project that I've taken on in the past year to do this is checking periodically to see how we're performing. How often does someone come here and get an answer? How often does someone come here and not get an answer? Because if we're failing to provide a space where people want to be answering questions, it means that we're not providing the space that we want to get out of here. In monitoring the health of the community, something that I do every month is check to see how the top 50 threads in the subreddit for the past month performed. That is to say, I boot up the search. You can search by uh, time, and I look the past month, and I see what got answered, what didn't get answered, how long is it taking an answer to come in. If we are doing well, generally speaking, we see roughly a 95% answer rate these days for the top 50 questions. Those questions represent pretty much any question that hits the top of the subreddit, averaging those average to be at the top for 14 hours to 20 hours, depending on how popular it is. And that is what most people come to the subreddit see. We really care a lot 
that those questions get answered because that is the face of the subreddit. That's what new people coming in are going to see. And we want to ensure that if you're coming here, you are getting content and seeing that content, great content is produced here every day. But I don't only look at those top 50 because even though those represent the most popular questions, as has come up already in other people's discussions here, the top question of the day is not necessarily the most interesting question of the day. And oftentimes you'll see a question which is absolutely fascinating, but it's only really of interest to the person asking it, the person answering it, and maybe 10, 15 people who upvoted it. We really want to make sure that those also get answered though, because that is the real guts of this community that people can come here and ask strange esoteric questions that they put a lot of thought into and someone will come and put the effort into answering it even though they're not getting the accolades that someone answering a thread with 10,000 upvotes is going to be getting. And for this, I have a similar methodology, but I look at a lot more than just 50 threads. I will open up every single question asked for seven semi-randomly chosen days of the month. I try to have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera, et cetera, without overlapping of weeks. And I also throw out major holidays. So this month, I'm not going to be counting Thanksgiving the day after Thanksgiving or the day before Thanksgiving, simply because the expectation is that a lot of the American audience will not be around. So it probably would influence the rate. Anyways, though, so I open up all those threads, which comes roughly to 800 to 900 threads per month. And I will go through every single one and check to see whether there's an answer, whether there's not an answer. I look at that and I come up with a percentage of how many questions are getting answered every single month. And we use that to monitor how we're doing. Generally speaking, if you come in and you ask a question, all other factors being the same, it has about a 40% chance of getting answered, which on the one hand, you might say, okay, but 60% of questions are not getting answered. And yes, that is a downside, don't get me wrong. But on the other hand, that means that there are people willing to step up and answer about 50 or so questions every single day for strangers on the internet, simply to enjoy the good feeling that you get from a couple upvotes being thrown your way. And additionally, if you look at Reddit as a whole, a lot of threads don't get attention. I also count not just the rate that a question is answered, I also look at how many threads are ignored. And also I have what I call the insufficient rate, which is the number of questions where someone tried to answer it, but we removed any answers that were in that thread the average insufficient rate comes to about 15% and the average ignored rate comes to about 45%. When you add all this together, what you're actually looking at is only 15% of threads, 14, 15% of threads are seeing someone try to answer it and that gets removed. And if you look at Reddit as a whole, this actually lines up very closely with how Reddit generally functions. Almost 50% of submissions on major subreddits get ignored entirely. So we're only removing a fairly small amount of content that doesn't fit. And what this tells us is that for the most part, our rules are working. We have a difference compared to the rest of Reddit of only 10 to 15% in how people are responding to threads. And it means for us that we're happy with how things are doing. What do we do to improve them? Sometimes we'll see a month where there's a drop. To look at, let me just call up my spreadsheet here. To look at how we've been doing the past couple months, we had the summer, we were doing really well. We had a 44% answer rate, a 42%, a 41%. But then last month, October, we dropped down to 35%. We look back and we try to see what is happening in that month that might have caused things to go down. Were questions, was it just a matter of a lot of questions seeming to be less interesting? Was it flares being less active? Or 
were we changing how we were moderating consciously or unconsciously? Because something that we really look to ensure is that we are moderating to an objective standard to anyone who comes into the subreddit and knows what they can expect on our end. We don't want to be removing something one day from someone, and then the next day someone posts something that's almost identical, and another mod comes along and they approve that or vice versa. We want to make sure that there's a consistency in moderation. And when there is a significant change in those rates, it means that we need to evaluate to make sure that we are maintaining that same quality that everyone expects from us. Something else that we do, though, and what this helps to inform us, as well as the periodic surveys that we take, is we really try to ensure that the flared community is happy with how the subreddit is going. To be sure, the subreddit is more than just its flares, it's more than just its mods. We depend heavily on just the regular users, the lurkers who come in and just upvote questions or upvote answers, people who ask questions because they don't know, and the users who they might not be experts on a topic enough to feel that they deserve flair, but they do know a lot about one very specific thing and there's a question in that specific field that they can answer very well but nevertheless the flared community which numbers between 300 uh between 300 and 400 users is the core component and we really do rely on them to ensure that the subreddit keeps working and keeps producing answers at the rate that we want to see so ensuring that the flared community is happy and that the flared community is on board with the vision that we have is really important to us and we reach out to them we try to work with them to do any if we're changing the rules we usually will reach out to them we'll t talk to them and see hey is this working well is this not working well what do you think about it and we use that to inform our decisions because if the subreddit is not operating how they want to see it operate they might not be coming back and likewise we try to encourage them to participate more Behind the scenes, a lot of the mods, we see that question and we know that it's a great question. We know that there's a specific flair who would really, really do a great job answering it. We'll reach out to them. We'll say, hey, this question popped up. It's in your field. We think it's really interesting. Don't feel any obligation, but if you have time, you should answer it. And we get a lot of positive feedback on that. And it, the flares feel that it helps to promote the community feeling that we want to see out of this subreddit. Moving forwards something that I really want to look to in the future and I've been working on, although it's a little more complicated, is looking not just at the performance of the subreddit itself, but also what topics drive Ask Historians and how can we better serve users in specific subfields that they're asking questions. Off the cuff, we know, for instance, that we get a lot of questions about World War II. It's very popular. They never stop coming in. We also know that we can cover World War II fairly well. We have a lot of flares who are in that field. But then the flip side is Southeast Asian history, for instance. When question, it's not the most popular topic to come in, but when questions do, we know that we have a very poor performance rate with Southeast Asia because we have very few flared users who cover that topic. This is something that looking to the future, we want to try to find ways to better address. How can we identify the underserved topic fields of history and how can we improve our performance there so the next project that i'm working on and i hope to be able to roll it out in the not too near or not too distant future sorry is a breakdown of not just how the performance how the suburb is performing but what topics perform best what topics perform worst and where can we improve in that field so hopefully something will come of it but we'll see anybody have any follow-ups for that okay. one joe so uh, I don't know if like one of my distinct impressions has always been that in terms of inter and and I don't think users really know this, but you mentioned like we're not that different from Reddit as a whole, and I think what most users don't realize is we have this about daily threat that hits all because it gets a, yes. a lot of upvotes, and that's. That's where the real most of the work comes in in terms of like removing comments. Oh, absolutely. I would like, say ninety percent of our removals come from whatever threads on top of the subreddit. Yeah, and that's really interesting because it's always these like people coming in from all and saying, Well, I never see any answers <laughs> in, in, in this subreddit and there oh. is never anything 
you know, it's all just removed. Really, it's just the selective reality of only seeing these threats where exactly because the people yes. come from all, we have to remove so much. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I won't lie, the reason I started this project in the first place, it was uh, it was entirely off the cuff. I, I it was a boring afternoon, I had nothing better to do. And someone was like, hey, I never see anything answered. And I was like, you know what, I want to see whether that's true. So I called up the last, the threads from the past month, and I went through, see how many were answered. And I was like, oh, hey, 95% of these were answered that in the past month. What the heck are you complaining about, man? <laughs> and what it comes down to is that a lot of users, they, especially if you're a first time user, or if you only come in once a month, you only come in because a thread is hit all. And what a lot of users forget is that someone's upvoting a question because they like the question, not because they like the answer. I mean, yes, once there is an answer, people will hopefully be upvoting the question because they think there's a great answer in there, but it is not a direct correlation. And you come in, especially if a question's only been up for three, four hours, you shouldn't be expecting an answer. I just wrote something today, and I think I spent two hours just reading background before I even started writing because I knew the general gist of what I was writing about, but I still needed to make sure I had specifics. I needed to find some good quotations. I need to find some good numbers. These answers just don't come out of the blue. And what a lot of users who are used to Reddit and the instant gratification of coming in and seeing a, let's be charitable, seeing a good discussion going on, um, they come in and it's the proverbial comment graveyard. And I understand if you've not been to Ask Historians before, it can be frustrating. and I don't want to come off as harsh, but we don't we don't cater to that user base. We cater to the users who come in and they are willing to be patient and they're willing to check back in three, four hours and say, oh wow, it got answered and wow, it was really worth the wait. And we it's a downside of Reddit that there aren't that many ways to encourage this. We use the top level warnings. We encourage people to use the remind me bot. We encourage people to use the RES subscription feature. But there really just isn't good native ways in Reddit to know to come back and check a thread in six hours, in 10 hours, in the time that it takes someone to put the effort into writing that answer. I, I do have one more thing. And I think, I think what also, like, we're talking about the plans to keep tabs on which topics are, are performing well. I think that is tied closely to like the Flare community being being the core of it all, because we sometimes see that some topics are done extremely well yeah. because we have one person who does a lot of the heavy lifting. Like um, Cassidy is is such an example. Like from, from what fashion questions we have, she answers a lot, and and Stefan also does a lot of this uh, thing. Rule. Uh, Sun is one, one of the most prolific answers. And um, in terms of the most popular topic, like World War II and, and the Nazis, like I, I don't know where we would be without Kislovsky fan. Or you. But, let's, 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 well, no. Don't tell yourself short. <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean like, I think, I think he's like our Kislovsky fan. They are one of the most prolific examples because they do so many questions. Yeah every day virtually so i think i think this is also really goes to show that those topics that perform well also perform well because there are some people who really invest a lot of time into oh absolutely it. there there is definitely a feedback loop that we notice and if we have good flares in a field it just encourages more questions in that field and when we don't have good flares it means less questions, and then there's less questions. We get less flares coming in on that topic again. So it kind of, it does absolutely just feed into itself. And when you don't get good, you don't get many questions about Southeast Asia, as we already mentioned. You don't get many questions about Oceania. You don't get many flares because they just don't have the opportunity. And we try to find ways to encourage people to come in and write about things that might not be popular. So we have the Monday Methods is a great way to highlight just talking about history for his, uh, the historiography and doing history itself. We have the Thursday thread where someone can come in and just talk about theory. We have Saturday where you can come in and just write a book review. And we try to encourage it, but people don't take enough advantage of it, we feel. And we definitely working on ways to promote Ask Historians to those 
flares who are in or potential flares, I should say, in fields that don't get coverage is another thing that we are always looking into and always trying to improve on, but we definitely aren't there yet. Okay. Uh, thank you guys all so much for coming here today and doing this panel. But I know, as with any meta thread, we will have a bunch of follow-up questions. So feel free to join us in Ask Historians for our follow-up thread, and you can ask all of our panelists or any of our panelists any specific questions you might have. And with that said, thank you all for joining me here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Barristan. This is Brian. Thank, thank you. you. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at AskHistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com Thank you very much for listening and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.